And if you just buy the right thing, you will be able to acquire the life that you want. And so stuff is associated with happiness. And so it's, it's not surprising that we go into homes and we see all this stuff that people accumulate thinking that they're buying happiness. But in fact, what they're buying is kind of a shadow of happiness. And I talk often that we buy products, but what we're actually buying is what I call a promise. Welcome to Spark Joy, the podcast dedicated to celebrating the Kamari method and the transformative power of surrounding yourself with joy and letting go of all the rest. With your hosts and certified Kamari consultants, Kristen Ivey and Karen Sochi. And now, here's the show. Our guest today on Spark Joy is Peter Walsh. Peter starred in the popular organization and design series, Clean Sweep on Discovery's TLC Network. The series produced over 120 episodes and has run almost continually since 2003. Peter is the author of six best-selling books on the subject of organizing, including How to Organize Just About Everything, It's All Too Much, an Easy Plan for Living a Richer Life with Less Stuff, and Does This Clutter Make My Butt Look Fat? Peter was a regular guest on the Oprah Winfrey Show, where he was dubbed the Get Your Life Organized Guy, which led to his own series, Extreme Clutter, on OWN. His goal is to help people live richer, happier lives with a little more organization. We're thrilled to have an organizing legend join us today to discuss keeping our homes in order during trying times. Welcome to Spot Joy, Peter. Well, thank you very much. I'm a little worried being called a legend because is that like Tarzan legend of the jungle? Is that <laughs> kind of the same? Is that the same category or is it a different kind of legend? I'm always just a little worried about that word being applied to me, but um, I guess I just have to take it. But thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. And we're thrilled to have you. You truly are someone we respect in in the organization community, and we have watched you inspire so many. Clean Sleep was one of my favorite shows back in the day. I absolutely loved it. That was my (laughs) first introduction to you. And I still remember that episode on Oprah, where you stacked up all of those boxes to truly show the average amount of clutter in an American home and in, in your client's home that you were helping out on that episode of Oprah. So you have just really inspired me throughout my career and just being interested in both design and organization. So, so happy to chat with you. And I would love to know a little bit more about your story and how you got started in the first place, kind of being interested in, in this business. It's a funny story, actually. The truth is that I was never terribly interested in home organizing. I mean, that's the truth. And that, that absolutely horrifies most people when I say that. My main interest really was in organizing in more commercial, industrial spaces. My background is a very, very mixed one. I was originally a teacher, Australian, obviously, by birth. I worked also in drug abuse prevention. I worked in health promotion, in risk reduction behaviors, in helping people in um, addictive services. I also worked in corporate development, in helping people develop interpersonal skills training programs in organizational settings. So help both in interpersonal skills training and also in organization in corporations in how to set up kind of the the physical settings for good organization. And um, in 2003, I was invited, I was living in LA and was invited to audition for a an organization show, which eventually became Clean Sweep. And I have an accent, as you may have noticed, and I think that helped quite a bit because Americans love accents. It's true. And um, I'd done a little bit of organizing in friends' homes and so on, not a great deal, but some. And um, I was invited to audition for this show, and I knew nothing would ever come of it. And I got the job. And interestingly, it has become this weird intersection of design which I love 
of psychology. I have a master's in educational psychology of, of this interpersonal skills, of risk reduction behaviours, of all of the different skills, even the teaching skills that I have, have all come together in helping people look at, at their stuff, at their homes, at their own behaviours in a way that I could never have imagined. And, and I've managed to pull all of those skills together in this organising career in a way that I think has really enriched me and, and really helped with the clients that I work with. I find it so interesting and really fascinating how many organizers come from kind of a helping profession background. And they often, as I did, find that that part of their professional development or their professional past was so useful in doing this work, which on the surface seems really unrelated. But one of the things that I find most amazing or interesting about you is this you have such a humorous and charming way of presenting your material (laughs) I mean you really make it fun and I think for a lot of people being disorganized is based in a lot of guilt and shame and a lot of Mm. feeling of overwhelmed and frustration just about anything but fun and charming and and lighthearted. how important do you think it is to have a sense of humor about the state of, of being disorganized and trying to get organized One of the things that I have found amazing is that by the time I'm invited into someone's home, or I think most organisers are invited into someone's home, people have gotten to a point where they've almost lost hope, where they've, they've had to acknowledge that things are out of control, that they no longer are able to do what they feel they should be able to do. And they do that. They invite you into their home almost as an act of desperation. And they are often filled with shame and self-loathing and and a sense of desperation. And so it's very important to step into that space and not be shocked and and not to express any form of judgment. And, And I've discovered over nearly 20 years of doing this that just acknowledging that we're all human, that we're all in the same boat, And that there's nothing to be ashamed of. Look, we all go off the rails occasionally and to temper this work with a bit of humour and, you know, to show to people it's not the end of the world, but you are there to lend a helping hand. And, you know, one of the main things that I think we do and certainly one of the main things that I do is to give people permission that they won't give themselves and to say to people, look, My job here is to simply help and support you. And if you can break the ice with people and just laugh a little bit with them, it really just shows people that, hey, at the end of the day, you are stronger than your stuff. If you can laugh in the face of this mountain of stuff, if you can laugh in the face of of you being overwhelmed by your stuff, then together we can get through this. And the truth is, I'm a little bit crazy and there's an element of being Australian that you can kind of get away with things. And the truth also is, with this accent, I can say some outrageous and silly things. And by the time anyone who's not Australian has understood what I've said, I've moved on to the next thing. And it's like, hang on, he didn't just say what I think he (laughs) said, did he? And I'm then on to the next thing. And then people laugh, but then it's too late for them to say anything. So I think not being so serious, having a sense of humour, and really using that to carry people along really help. I think it helps a great deal. And it certainly has helped me a huge deal. Yeah, you are stronger than your stuff. What a powerful message. And it really resonates with through a lot of the books and series that you've put out there about how it's just all too much, right? Yeah. Really just focusing on the importance of getting to the underlying reason why we accumulate so much stuff and giving us permission to really explore that further. Can you share a bit with our listeners what you have discovered that leads us to doing things like over shopping or buying things we don't need, but yet never feeling satisfied. It's interesting. Buying stuff and accumulating stuff is such such an integral part of our society. I mean, 
people are surprised when you tell them, you know, some basic statistics. You know, for example, America, we have 50% of the world's population, half the world's population. And, you know, we consume, you know, 24% of the world's resources. The average American sees nearly 10,000, between four and 10,000 advertisements a day. And we live in a society that tells us that more is better, that if one is good, then two is great, and, and that stuff is a sign of our success. And it's almost stuff is indicative of love. If you love someone, you will buy them a gift. Gifts are part of, of every celebration. You give a gift for a wedding. You give a gift for a birthday. You give a gift at Christmas. You give a gift for graduation. And that what you have is good, and this is the basis of advertising, what you have is good, but the next thing you buy, if you will just buy this next thing, it is great. And if you just buy the right thing, you will be able to acquire the life that you want. And so stuff is associated with happiness. And so it's, it's not surprising that we go into homes and we see all this stuff that people accumulate thinking that they're buying happiness. But in fact, what they're buying is kind of a shadow of happiness. And I talk often that we buy products but what we're actually buying is what I call a promise. We buy the stepmaster, but what we're actually buying, the product, but what we're actually buying is the promise that somehow we will magically get thinner. We buy the skinny jeans, the product, but what we're actually buying is the promise that somehow we will magically be more attractive. We buy the makeup, the product, but what we're actually buying is the promise that somehow we will be sexier. We buy the the late night TV advertisement, the products or the kitchenware, but we're, what we're buying is the promise that somehow we will magically be a better cook. And so homes are filled with all of these products, but they're actually littered with the unfulfilled promises of being sexier or thinner or more attractive. And so it's not surprising that we chase this dream of happiness through stuff and we never, ever get there. And, you know, houses are bigger. They're fuller. Houses today are, are twice the size that they were in the 50s. And yet families are half the size. And, you know, that's what, that's what our society is built on. They're built on this kind of dream of the acquisition of stuff, the acquisition, too, of happiness through stuff. And yet it, it never comes. And I think it's interesting that, um, you know, that at the moment particularly, we're at a stage where I think a lot of people are realizing, wow, you know, we've acquired so much stuff and it hasn't brought us happiness. So it's so interwoven in our society that it's hard to separate, you know, the stuff from the dream from the happiness. And um, I think that's terribly sad. Yeah, and not only is there a society full of, like you said, homes with all these promises, really, that can manifest into clutter, the default solution is then to buy the promise of the attractive bin that's <laughs> bigger, better, you know, taller, slimmer, made of this material or that material without really the self-awareness that's required to really change some patterns or even a mindset, right, around what we should keep, what we should let go of, and really redefining what enough means for us. Well, you know, the, the best thing you can do to organize your stuff is to buy more stuff to organize your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the default position, you know, and I think, you know, there is this whole industry that's built around buying stuff to organize your stuff. And it's, it's fascinating, you know, there's the, the 80, 20 rule. And there's actually, there's actually a very real name for the 80, 20 rule. And, um, you know, it's very much typified by the fact that we wear 20% of our clothes 80% of the time. And uh, when I go into people's homes, for example, without exception, you know, people will say to me, well, how much do you think 
how much do you think we'll end up getting rid of? And without missing a beat, I say, well, you know, I would say somewhere between 70 and 80 percent and people absolutely lose it every time, <laughs> you know, no way. But without exception and generally often with a bit of a struggle, but without exception, when we're finished, close to 80 percent of what was in the house goes. And that's because it is absolutely true that we only use on a regular basis about 20% of what is in our home. And people always, you know, look at me with absolute, you know, absolutely aghast. But that is true. We have so much stuff in our home that we simply don't use. And that is astounding when you consider that in the average American home, there are about 300,000 items. It's absolutely staggering. And if you go into any you know, and I'm kind of branching out here because you've already forced me to climb up on my soapbox. <laughs> if you go into any home goods store, and I think to be blunt, the organizing industry has a, and we, and I, I include me in this, has a lot to answer for. You know, plastics, plastics are a massive blight on the planet. And we have for years blithely, or, you know, suggested, you know, plastic bins are a great solution for organizing and they have been but if you go into any organizing store you know there are miles and miles of plastic bins for organizing you know they're a massive blight on the planet in terms of global warming and if you go into any organizing store any home goods store everything's made of plastic those days have to come to an end because you know if not our, our great grandchildren are going to be up to their waist in in warm water and nothing to eat and nothing to shelter them. As I say, we of the organising industry, at some stage, you've got to step up and say enough because we can no longer promote, you know, those attractive things. And again, I'm, I'm way off on a tangent here, but I think that, that at some stage, we're going to have to take a hard look at ourselves in our own history, short though it may be, and really do an about face in this area. Anyway, hang on, let me just climb down. <laughs> off the box. I'm down off the soapbox. Why even be organised? And it's because the word organised and the word organic etymologically come from the same root. Organic, to be whole, to be human, to be complete, to be one, to be whole. And, you know, because we all want to eat more organically, we all want to be more organic. And so when you become more organised, you move to being more organic. And what could be more organic than a whole planet, than a whole ecosystem? And so when we talk about being organized, you can't talk about it separately than apart from the, the ecosystem, the community, the suburb, the city, the state, the country, the planet that we live in. And I think we've looked at it to, in, in too micro a way we have to look at it as planetary citizens. And I think that day, that's going to be the next wave for us as organisers and, and as for planetary citizens. Yeah, I hope you're right. I think you're right on with, with, with what you're saying. And I, I find it really interesting to think that this idea that organic and organised are so related, because when I think of how people benefit from being organised, they feel more whole. They feel more mm -hmm. self-aware. They feel more accomplished they feel more absolutely they feel less anxious and less overwhelmed so I think that that all ties in so well together and you know got kind of moving toward this idea of how do we achieve that you know Marie Kondo is, is very focused on this idea of, of working category by category where you're a little bit more about location by location and you, you're your writing really focuses on step by step how to achieve that organization in your home. Now, uh, I think different people respond to different kinds of approaches, and I certainly have seen that in my practice. And just wondering what your take is on how to determine what type of approach or what method might work best for someone who's listening. You know, we, of course, love Marie, but not, she's not for everyone, so it's perfectly yeah. fine if you have some criticisms. Yeah. You know, I, I've worked with Marie before and met her, and um, it's interesting. People, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not suggesting this is you, but it's been interesting since she's become very much into the public realm. And you know, I have, I've been around since 
you know, for a long time in the organizing area. And, and very frequently, journalists have come to me asking for a critical analysis of Marie's methods. And I don't have a lot of criticism of her. Her method is very different to mine, but it's way more similar than I think people at first glance think. And I think some of it is a language issue in terms of the terminology that we use. And I think that, that the main way we differ, I think our methods are way more similar than you might think, but I think the way our methods mainly differ is that Marie tends to focus in the first instance on the stuff, that, that her approach, and I, I would take some exception to the point about she tends to have a category approach and I have a location by location approach. I would phrase it somewhat differently. She tends to start very much certainly in a category approach by the stuff, you know, whether it be, um, I don't know, particular types of clothing or in a particular, you know, particular types or, or categories of items in a room. I tend not to start with the stuff at all. And it's unfortunate in a lot of the ways you see the work that I do, particularly on television shows and so on, that the producers tend not to show a very fundamental part of my work because, frankly, it doesn't make good TV. A very fundamental part of my work is to start by asking the question of my clients, what is the vision you have for the life you want? One of the biggest problems that people that I think we have in our society and with the people that I work with is that we use the word for, F-O-R, way too much. What do you want for your home? What do you want for this room? Well, for this room, you know, I want shag carpet. I want a yellow couch. I want these kind of drapes. I want this colored paint. I want I want, I want, instead of using the word from. What do you want from this room? I want peace. I want calm. I want something that's welcoming. I want something that's serene. I want somewhere where family can gather. Because if you start with the word from, it completely changes how you decide what you will have in that space. The stuff we own should help us create the life we want. And so I always start with, does the stuff you own help you create what you want from this room? The question, does it spark joy, is a simple one, but not so easy to execute alone. Extend your tidying experience by joining the Spark Joy Club our online community filled with our clients, fellow listeners, and Kamari enthusiasts ready to support your journey. If you find yourself buried under clothing, stuck on storage, or pointing fingers at untidy housemates or family members, we want to help you finish your tidying journey once and for all. Support the show at the Joy Riser level and receive access to our exclusive virtual community, as well as the Tidy Home Joy Journal, your number one tidying companion. Visit sparkjoypodcast.com and click on Join the Club to get started. And now back to the show. And so for me, it's a slightly different approach to Marie and we might end up in the same place. But And she would be asking, do these spark joy? And you can see we come from a slightly different angle. My question is, do they help you create the vision you have for the space? Do they give you what you want from the space? Mm -hmm. And for me, if a couple agrees on what they want from the space, the mood, then it's much easier for them to come to the answer of do the things in the room create what they want. That's part one. And part two is you then have to decide, do the things you want in the room fit in that space? Because I hear often we don't have enough space and that is a complete falsehood 
because we've all been in relationships with someone who doesn't honour and respect us and those kind of relationships can never last. And it is exactly the same with your space. If you don't respect your space, if you overload it, if you cram your closets or your drawers with too much stuff, if you overload your bookshelves in the same way that if you dishonour a person, that that relationship can never last, if you dishonour your space, you can never be happy in that space. We know it about relationships and yet we constantly do it in our homes and expect we can be happy in a space when we treat it with dishonour and disrespect. I love that you mentioned honour and respect because that shows up so much within the Kanmari method as well. Like you mm-hmm. said, you and Marie, your methods really do echo yeah. and work together um, and complement yeah. each other more than being two different, completely different viewpoints or styles. Yeah. Like similar to what you mentioned, how often your discussions with families are, are cut short a bit due to editing, um, similar yeah of which happened on on the Netflix Tidying Up show where Maria yeah. was taking the time to walk through that important question in Kamari, rule number one, establishing your ideal lifestyle and ideal living environment. And that just doesn't make reality DGB. Right. <laughs> I'd say that's exactly the trade-off and people don't understand that. And I remember, you know, my show Clean Sweep was one of the very, very first shows on television. You know, Clean House followed very closely. And I remember one of the very first conferences, I spoke at one of the the national um, organizers conferences and people were very angry at me being invited to speak because at the time, audiences were somewhat unsophisticated in terms of, well, you're suggesting that in two days, just you can organize (laughs) two rooms in a house and we did do that in two days, but I had a team of 30 people behind me. Yeah. You know, and now everyone knows that. But in those days, you know, people were saying, you know, it's an illusion and you're creating completely, you know, the wrong sense. But that's the trade off in creating a TV show that, you know, do you build this whole awareness around what the organizing industry does or do you not do that? And no one knows that there are professional organizers. Because you have to trade off on the magic of TV. And as the front person, you have no say in how the show eventually appears. Right. Yeah, definitely. We learned that uh, actually by interviewing (laughs) the two Kanmari consultants that helped all eight families on the show behind the scenes for hours after Marie Kondo left. And we interviewed them on Spark Joy episode 68 after we reviewed the show ourselves in episode 67. So yeah. we definitely got a glimpse of what happens behind the scenes for sure. There's yeah. so many hands uh, working on those shows and yeah. it doesn't always reflect the true essence of what's going on. I thought the show, I mean, I, I watched the show. I was not a big fan of it because I could see that there was a lot more going on. Sure. And for me, it's never about the stuff. You know, the interesting thing is, and I think Marie's method She's very much about how the stuff is stored. And I think that's a cultural thing because of the huge space constraints in Japan. Mm -hmm. And that's not such an issue here. And for me, it's never about the stuff. You know, issues around clutter are very much about loss and trauma and abuse and neglect and abandonment. And unless you can get to those issues, people never deal with the clutter because the clutter is like a silver spoon it's the distraction and you have to help people acknowledge face and deal with the underlying issues and I think that's that's where the interest is and and to be honest and people are surprised when I say this I don't care that much about the stuff you know the stuff is a distraction and I don't go into people's homes to help them deal with the stuff although we do deal with the stuff, but that's always second to dealing with what's really going on here. 
it's so true. And speaking of dealing with stuff or just being more aware of what's going on in our, our homes, we should probably address the elephant in the room, which is what we're all dealing with here, really under a stay at home advisory for sure and ordinance. Mm-hmm. Uh, really dealing with something that none of us are familiar with, which is a worldwide pandemic. And we are now a lot closer to our clutter than usual. And some are facing it somewhat for the first time for extended periods of time with us spending so much time at home. So for those listeners who want to use this time to maybe create that retreat, that sanctuary that we talked about earlier in their homes, What do you recommend as a way to really start to plan an organizational project amongst all of the priorities that everyone's juggling these days? One thing that my client, for example, texted me the other day, she said she was on Reddit and she says there's a lot of people that all of a sudden want to kickstart their Kanmari event because they're now at home and they now have the time, quote unquote, that they haven't felt like they've had in the past to declutter. Something we discussed on the show is how do you get motivated? Yeah. So for those who just want to kind of rejuvenate their relationship with what's surrounding them at home, do you have any tips? It's so funny you ask this question because it's not really about the stuff. Again, you know, for many, because I'm getting so many emails that are this question, but when you delve a little bit, it's not about the decluttering or the stuff. It's really about how do I get motivated to do it? Mm-hmm. When you scratch the surface, they're two completely different things. And in some ways, the question is really how do I deal with the fear and the anxiety that we're all facing at the moment? I think people are looking to get some control of that. And so they're looking to organizing as a way of control and it's interesting we saw this surge at the time of the Iraq war because when there is a lot of turmoil in the world people do look to getting some control often by something as seemingly silly as organizing their closets and for me I think there are two things we can suggest and I certainly am doing this one is find a small project because if you suggest anything large it becomes too overwhelming and one of the things I've done is every January I do a thing called the 31 days to get organized and it's one 10 minute challenge a day which often if you talk about my weird and wacky sense of humor don't look at it if you don't like crazy senses of humor all of those are on my YouTube channel so And a lot of people are going back to look at those one 10-minute challenge a day. And they're they're simple little areas that you can look at. The linen closet, your undies drawer, under the kitchen sink, your towels, whatever. So I suggest and, you know, suggest to your clients, look, choose just the Tupperware drawer, the area under the sink, you know, whatever it is, one cupboard above the washing machine. Another one that I suggest is what I call the trash bag tango. And what you do is you get everyone in the house, let's say there are four of you in the house, you set a timer on someone's cell phone for 10 minutes. Everyone runs around the house with two trash bags. Into one of the trash bags, doesn't matter how big or how small, you put anything that's trash, old newspapers, stuff for recycling, clothing that's ripped, it doesn't matter, stuff for trash or recycling. And in the other, you put things that you're happy to have donated, toys that no longer use, books you've read, it doesn't matter, whatever. And at the end of 10 minutes, you're done. You put the first bags in the trash or recycling and the others you throw in the trunk of your car to be donated once this self-isolation's over. If four of you do that for one week, at the end of the week, you will have 28 bags of trash And you will have 28 bags of stuff for donation. You will have 56 bags of stuff leaving the house if you do that in one week. If for two weeks of self-isolation, you will have 112 bags 
of stuff leaving your house. 10 minutes a day. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Super simple. And if you want to make a game out of it, every day when you're finished, everybody steps on a scale holding their donation bag and you make a chart and you weigh, obviously, you deduct your own weight and you weigh who has got the most in their donation bag. So at the end of two weeks, that person chooses when the uh, self-isolation is lifted, where you go for a meal and what movie you see as a family or where you go for your next family holiday if you really want to wrap it up. Oh, I love that. Call it whatever you want. Why the clutter challenge? Well, and it, certainly now that so many kids are at home, this would be a mm. great thing to keep them busy and enthusiastic and get a little more organized in the process. Absolutely. Everyone's sitting at home. You need to get up and get moving and have fun. Every kid has a ton of non-age appropriate toys that they don't touch anymore, books they no longer read, shoes they no longer wear, clothes they don't like. Here's the way to start getting it. And then they're going to love, you know, doing a little bit of math by weight, deducting their weight from their weight plus, you know, they'll wish they used the metric system because it would be a whole lot easier. But no, they have to use, you know, says me. Um, but, he, you know, here's a way of making it fun, including a learning experience. Organising doesn't have to be a boring thing. I can think of all kinds of ways that parents could add this kind of a process to their lesson plans. You know, as you said, Absolutely. there's a little bit of archaeology going on. <laughs> yeah. Getting yeah. through the old toy box and math and all kinds yeah. of things going on. There are tons of different activities you could do with your kids that are decluttering activities you know, and get the kids involved. Now, speaking of being at home and spending a lot more time at home now, of course, along with the kids, do you have any recommendations for how people can get a little more control over their, their time and their work? The first thing you have to do is establish a schedule. In the same way that if you are at work, you would have a calendar and a meeting schedule and you would plot out your day, you have to do that from day one plot a schedule and establish a routine and stick to it and even if you have to sit down with the family if you haven't done it already and even if you're a week or or x days into this start today sit the family down and plot out a schedule because if the kids are there as well everyone needs to be on this schedule with a routine because more than anyone kids need a routine but you need a routine also so that you won't lose your mind and everyone breaks for a morning break the kids know when they have to go and have a quiet reading time so that you can then for example get you know online uh, video conferencing meetings happening during that quiet time you establish zones in the house where people have to go for quiet time establish a work area that is a sacrosanct area that people cannot touch, the kids cannot touch, so that you don't have to worry about moving work stuff. You also create break times, for example, late morning before lunch when you break for lunch, when, for example, you and the family can get out of the house and do a little bit of, of exercise, for example, a walk around the block to get some air and exercise while still being very careful to practice social distancing. The two most important things are a schedule and a routine that everyone knows what it is and you post that somewhere in the house and you stick to it and you have clear zones where people retreat to so that everyone knows where those zones are, even if you label them so that you create some order in your house so it's not a free-for-all. And that will create some sense of internal control in the house, which will immediately impose a sense of, of kind of, um, of, of order, I guess is the word, that will help you feel organized in your space. Great tips, Peter. I know our listeners are going to absolutely love these. We have a challenge for you. And we yeah. have to ask you, because we do ask every guest we have, whether they're an organizing professional or there's someone within the wellness space, we always ask the question, thinking of all of your tips, 
all the things you've shared over decades here around organizing, what is your favorite organizing tip? Do you have one? Um, I think, and this will sound a little funny, my favorite organizing tip is just to retreat. For me, the, the link between organizing and organic is really important. We live in a society where everything is so busy, where everything is so I need it now, you know, this instant gratification thing, whether it's, you know, we have to return a text immediately, we have to answer an email immediately. It's really important to retreat into quiet for at least five minutes a day. Just find a quiet place and sit and just concentrate on your breathing and although it may not sound like a tidying tip or an organizing tip, it will really help you to center yourself. And it's amazing what a difference that can make in terms of you finding a peaceful place that really then helps you to step back into the craziness and the busyness of the world, particularly at the moment, one. And two, particularly at the moment in these crazy, insane times of COVID-19, Take a media break. Turn off the 24-7 news cycle. I'm not saying put your head in the sand, but at the moment, the news is absolutely pumping out a ton of fear and anxiety that is feeding a massive amount of crazy anxiety in the world. What we know about COVID-19 is that we need to socially isolate. That is the main thing. We need to wash our hands regularly and we need to stay at home. They are the things we know most of all. Beyond that, there's not a lot of news. We need to be careful. Stay informed, but for God's sake, turn off the news or at least take a news diet at the moment, particularly if you have kids at home, because at the moment what that is doing is feeding fear and anxiety and that is pushing everyone off the edge. Wow, such a good point. I, I do feel that that's really a danger right now. And you're really trying to get back to some level of wholeness. And I think taking a yep. few minutes to meditate and, and think about something other than news is super important. And speaking of the opposite of feeling stress and anxiety, we have to ask, what is sparking the most joy for you at this very moment? It sounds really corny and a little Pollyanna-ish, but I think there is there is something very interesting happening at the moment. In the spite of the fear and the anxiety that COVID-19 is generating, I think we are seeing this as a massive global reset button. We're going to come out of this with people seeing that the insanity of chasing more, that the race to be something other than we are, that the, the fascination of being online 24-7 is not as important as staying connected to those we love and getting back in touch with the people who have made a significant difference in our life is what's most important. And for me at the moment, the biggest joy for me is just going back and acknowledging that I have fallen out of touch with so many people who've made a difference in my life and getting back in touch with those people. Such a great thing for all of us to be thinking about right now, I think. Yeah. What matters? What matters? Yeah, what matters? Absolutely. Let me say one last thing in the moment of COVID-19. I was exposed to the virus about eight days ago. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and I know that for a fact. 80% of people who are exposed to this virus will have mild to medium symptoms. I've shown symptoms for about the last four days. I've spoken to my doctor. It appears I probably have a very mild case, which is going to be true for most people. I have no temperature. I do have a weird cough. And I think that's going to be true for many people. What it means is that we do have to be careful. We do have to wash our hands and we do have to socially isolate. I'm now in quarantine for at least another week to bring it up to two full weeks. So be careful, but be sensible about it. Like, don't hoard food. If you have masks that you may have hoarded, for goodness sake, contact your local hospital that we have done and donate them to first responders. They're the ones who are most important in this time. And just keep calm, people. Like, this too will pass. 
but we need to keep our heads in a crazy time. That's what's most important, you know, above all else. Just stay calm and do what you can for those around you. That's what's most important. So important, Peter. And thank you for sharing that perspective. And we hope you get well very, very soon. So, Peter, how can our listeners get in touch with you? What's the best way to to learn more about the work that you're doing? I have a website, peterwalshdesign.com. I have a Facebook page. I mainly communicate on Facebook. I have a YouTube channel. I mentioned those 10-minute challenges. There are five past years. There's over 150 of those challenges on my Facebook page. I answer all my own email, which even as I'm saying that, I'm sorry I just said that on a national podcast, but that's true. (laughs) You know, it's um, that's about it. I've just released a new book called um, Let It Go, which is all about downsizing as we move into, I think many people particularly here are looking at moving into smaller spaces. I think that's going to be a huge thing also after this, this nightmare's over. I can't tell you how grateful we are to have you on the show. And it was certainly the right time to have a chance to speak with you. And it's been an absolute delight. And and we thank you so much, Peter, for taking the time to to visit with us today. Thank you, guys. Great podcast. Thank you. Thank you for pumping out this information. It's awesome. And keep up the great work. Thanks so much. So now we want to hear from you. Tell us your burning, tidying questions or share stories about how Kamari has impacted your life. Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe and review the show, which helps us reach others along their tidying journeys. To extend your tidying experience, you can join the Spark Joy Club. Visit sparkjoypodcast.com and click join the club to become a member of the Spark Joy community or join us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks for tuning in and we hope your day sparks joy. Thank you for listening to Spark Joy with your hosts, Kristen Ivey of For the Love of Tidy in Chicago and Karen Sochi of The Serene Home in New York City. Spark Joy, the podcast, is not endorsed by or affiliated with Kamari Media Inc. The opinions expressed on this episode represent the views of the co hosts and guests alone and do not represent the corporate position of Kamari Media Inc. or the Kamari Consultant Community.